Right. Um, we uh, sort of divided responsibilities. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give uh, a bigger sort of picture and uh, a little bit of a conceptual background to what's happening with the digitalization and digital law in uh, in Russia and also touch a little bit on data protection and a little bit on um, uh, what what are the issues with a contemporary with the current situation. Uh, although um, um, I would have much preferred uh, my colleague, who is also a co-author of the um, uh, of the uh, chapter in a Russian digital studies handbook that we've done, Alexander Gurkov, actually, to do that. But unfortunately, he couldn't make it. Uh, we are in a very, speaking of platforms, we're actually transferring from one grading and teaching platform to another right now with the University of Helsinki. And that's a nightmare, as uh, Pivy can attest. And so we are in the middle, and he's the vice director of the program of one masters and I'm on the other so it's a nightmare what, what's going to happen and so we're sort of remembering how to do that by hand you know um, and uh, thanks God I'm Russian and he is so we still remember how we use these sheets actually to put the grades for the students you know that's what I've, I've been doing um, so um, I do apologize and I'm very sorry that he's not here he would have been a great um, uh, addition to this workshop and uh, sort of participant uh, of this talk so what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to share my screen as just for a couple of minutes I'm very unfashionable today no powerpoint uh, for a point that I'm actually quite tired of just looking at PowerPoints during these workshops. So I, I would much uh, prefer to, to actually look at people. And um, I'll just share the screen to show the handbook and the uh, which might be useful for all of you. Um, and it's open access. So let me see. Right. So, yes. So can you see the screen? Right, so that's the um, uh, digital uh, handbook of digital Russia studies, and um, so we've done it as a collective of scholars um, um, in based in Helsinki first of all, but then we invited uh, a number of scholars here. That's an open access book, and uh, it actually has 33 chapters, and um, a lot of chapters are very relevant to the discussion today. So um, our chapter is law and digitalization in Russia, but also there is a, um, let me, uh, so if you're interested in this uh, handbook, you just go um, access this book for free. It's open access, so you can download it from Springer. So it could be PDF or uh, EPU. And um, so, um, so our chapter is law and digitalization, and then uh, Sasha did um, a personal data protection in Russia as well, so which is very relevant to uh, to the discussion, but also we have a lot of other chapters might be interested, cyber and punishment. I also did another chapter, uh, Doing Gender Online, where we talk about um, how um, access to platforms and the way the apps are developed and platforms are developed are actually very gendered in terms of what they target, how they target that. And also um, uh, where we talk about how regulations and policies are very gendered, although we tend to think that cyberspace is devoid of like gender class and, and all that. It's not um, like that. So if you're interested, so check the chapter as well. So it's uh, plenty of chapters and um, uh, to, to, look, uh, to look at. So please download the book and uh, use the book for further information or for the background of, of your um, study. So I stop sharing um, and um, uh, oops, and uh, proceed. So I am a professor of Russian law at the University of Helsinki. My primary area of expertise is human rights and particularly human rights of women and um, LGBTQI uh, plus uh, uh, people. Um, I've been doing a lot of digital studies, mostly in connection with uh, access to justice and how um, uh, access to justice works across um, uh, class, gender, uh, space, age, and other signifiers. And of course, as a human rights issue, and uh, so I've been particularly interested in uh, how these policies, which we proceed to think 
are universal are actually quite gendered in a way that how sort of they are applied to both cyberspace and uh, the physical space. So we usually talk about taking physical space into cyberspace and that uh, very much involves the law. So it doesn't basically matter. Um, uh, but so we tend to think and we in the 90s, we could used to think that it's a very um, a democratic space, right? Cyberspace, a very democratic space. Now, of course, we know it's not um, safe and it's not democratic democratic and it's definitely not uh, um, uncontrollable and you know things like that so just uh, that's that's just what I do and um, in a 10 minutes that I uh, have left I'll uh, go in to give you the bigger sort of picture of what's uh, happening in Russia and then as I said Larissa will be uh, giving you the more nuanced uh, in very specific uh, uh, sort of um, analysis of how data is non-processed right <laughs> in in the platforms so um, despite um, uh, sort of there's a lot of conceptualization of uh, Russia's um, uh, digitalization and uh, digital projects, uh, including law, and the majority of these concepts come from political science, and they are mostly based on classifying uh, Russia's political regime as uh, either hybrid, we could choose to do that, or authoritarian uh, today. And the way this uh, type of uh, sort of governments or regimes use a digital law and, and the whole process of digitalization um, to uh, mostly uh, either show off to the West, quote unquote, or control the population, I actually don't see it like that. So um, in a sense, I um, sort of disagree with this political science literature because in my opinion, um, the digitalization per se is a very much part of what you uh, of of the of the involvement of of um, of, uh, of any other country. So it doesn't matter whether you are authoritarian or not. You still use and digitalize and try to provide services uh, for the population and introduce platforms because we are in a global world. You cannot get away from that. But of course, the way you do that, that's where sort of all the uh, problems arise in a sense that what is the best way? And I, um, um, I'm aware that uh, your uh, group has been <laughs> have been discussing this, this particular issue. So what would be the uh, most efficient way of, of regulating or, or using or processing data and using platforms? So in in, uh, just to give you a little bit of a historical background, um, Russia actually started the project called Open Government, we call that in Russian, uh, quite uh, early on. Uh, and um, the Open Government uh, project, uh, in fact, uh, involved the integral uh, sort of, um, um, uh, it's, it's, it was as early, so the idea came as early as 2002. And so that involves the integral um, 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 uh, sort of the, the, the integral or platform of services that would both process the data, but at the same time would provide a number of services, both to the population, but also to the government. And so parts of this, um, uh, parts of this um, open government uh, package included uh, creating the om omnipresent uh, platform called Gososlugi, so state services, we call them. And the state services is this platform where you can do pretty much anything, um, even get your COVID job basically through that. Uh, well, not you can't do the COVID job through that, but uh, you can, of course, register. And uh, it's pretty efficient, actually. I've done that myself. I always try all the services uh, just to see if it works or not. Um, uh, but also, um, at the same time, there's a number of other uh, services as a part of the open government uh, project. Um, and uh, if you think about law and access to law, there's a lot of actually legal uh, uh, types of services that you also can uh, do. There's a, um, the, um, um, the arbitration service came first, the arbitration uh, law came first to be uh, a part of this and all the platforms for lawyers uh, to, um, uh, to uh, create um, uh, to, to process um, sort of court cases and arbitration cases um, through more arbiter, my arbiter. So that's, that's something like that. So that, that came to life um, in about uh, 2008. And then uh, uh, from 16, 17, um, there's this um, uh, other electronic sort of processing of um, applications and uh, files in court cases. Not every, not every, it doesn't look as rosy as that. There's a lot of paperwork which should be now transferred to electronic format. But at least you can do that. So in terms of access to justice, uh, in a sense, the idea was that it would reduce 
quote unquote corruption and efficiency and all that. But um, uh, the studies that have been done since 2017 actually show that it could be both an obstacle, so create additional barriers uh, to actually people who don't who are not uh, digital illiterate, right, to 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 use that. But at the same time, uh, it involves a lot of lawyers who now should be digital literate because I mean, in the, in the sense, they are the ones who who do the whole um, uploading the applications through uh, through the platform. So in a sense, uh, if you look at, at how this development is happening and just forget a little bit about the control issues and, and the uh, data protection issues, it's been quite a um, successful evolvement of digitalization and uh, especially involving the legal services digitalization in Russia. But the problem is, of course, that um, in all of this, uh, there's a lot of uh, the processing of data and data processing is a what we call the regulation of RUNET, you know, the regulation of internet. Is that the, the much more problematic issue than uh, it has been? Now, uh, I'm not saying it's more problematic in Russia than, say, in, in um in the United States. I think it's pretty much the same, but in the sense the approach to uh, how data is used, processed, and abused um, is um, is crucial. And um, so uh, we have a number of, um, again, uh, agencies that are um, uh, responsible for um, sort of regulating uh, of uh, internet and cyberspace and internet uh, and uh, digital platforms. And um, I, I'm pretty sure you've probably heard of Roskomnadzor as, 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 you know, as a word. And everybody thinks it's a new, I don't know, Gestapo or something, you know, for internet. Uh, well, sometimes. But the Roskomnadzor, of course, is that it, 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 it came to an existence as a pretty neutral word talk of uh, um, um, the uh, communication uh, services. So it's uh, the, 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 the title of this is a federal service for supervision of communications, information technology and mass media. It has been there forever. So it has been there for a long time. And um, but um, the problem is that with um, the increasing um, uh, usage of digital services, also, um, we, we need to remember that um, cyberspace is not uh, safe. And um, I've uh, heard right now that you're doing a lot of hate speech, online hate speech uh, studies. Um, so um, so the, 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 this space is very problematic. On the one hand, you have um, a, a lot of good that comes with the digital platforms, but at the same time, you have uh, a lot of uh, crime actually going on uh, on those platforms. And we used to think about this crime as a, um, a mostly um, identity theft or or, um, or um, a theft of data, but actually on the top of this, I mean, data protection is important, but on top of this now we have new challenges that are increasing in a way that uh, the more and more people become digital literate. So um, the more digital participation we have and the more people uh, participate in this thinking about uh, that as a concept of digital citizenship, as, as that's the other point, the more sort of um, crime you also have in a sense that a lot of this crime is uh, hate speech, but then you have bullying, stalking, you have uh, a lot of things like that. So uh, in a sense, you need a regulator. You you cannot, I mean, you have two choices, right? You you, you can leave it unregulated and, and you need a regulator. But, the, but, but of course, once you actually have the regulator, then the discussion is, and that's the Russian ongoing discussion in Russia and about Russia. So how do you, how, to what degree you regulate? So how much of the intervention into um, the um, um, sort of privacy, pr privacy and, and, and data you need to have. So what happened is that um, starting 16, 17, we have uh, more sort of closing down on regulation on that. So um, there's a um, administrative regulation. There are a couple of federal laws, of course, that regulate uh, the data, but I'm not going to, I mean, and again, you can uh, look up the articles and have the list of federal laws. It's a uh, federal law is the major law that regulates that. Um, but also in Russia, what you have, you have a federal law, but then you have uh, what we call the subnormative uh, um, uh, acts. And the subnorm is a lot of uh, ministries, uh, instructions and ordinances and all that. So you have the um, important communication sort of administrative regulation uh, that uh, is called on introducing the register of operators processed personal data. So that's the special register that uh, is um, actually including all the operators that uh, have an ability to process that you need to be registered there. And then um, there's um, a 
the federal law um, uh, that regulates uh, the processing of uh, personal information. So that's um, uh, number 40 and the 147, all information, information technologies and protection of information. Um, that, that is the most problematic federal law because it was amended uh, in, um, um, so it was amended in 2016 and um, in, in between 2012 and 2016. And uh, you probably again heard of a famous Yeravaya package and, and um, that's the deputy of the state Duma who uh, offered the changes into that law that uh, mostly focused on uh, prohibition um, sort of on, on the security legislation uh, that uh, would um, um, uh, sort of that would um, include the localization clause. So everything should be in Russia or based in Russia. And you probably know that LinkedIn that refused to store the data in Russia was uh, you can't access unless you use a VPN LinkedIn in Russia. So, you know, you have to store your data uh, in Russia for the for the platform. Um, I can theorize a lot in the connection with sovereignty here, but I'm not going to do that. So, and uh, I have a couple of minutes left. Uh, so um, uh, that's one of the uh, sort of uh, important um, 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 sort of very problematic issue, right? I mean, I do understand the logic behind that, but at the same time, being Russian, we do not trust the government. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be very conservative, pro-Putin, whatever, you still don't trust the government. And so we don't trust the government, which means that um, uh, everybody sort of uh, looked at this regulation as additional means of control. So we basically need to control the data and that's so and that, that's the point of surveillance. And the other part of it um, sort of gave a uh, way of um, introducing the further latest 2019 um, amendments um, that uh, limited uh, sort of access to indecent or fake information uh, against the government. That is uh, what we call policing regulations, right? And so that's another part of, of uh, sort of platform regulation. So um, there's, of course, um, uh, also tightening control on what you can repost. That, that's the other problem. So in a sense, um, a, and that's where we sort of theorize that you take your physicality into law. And in a way, how that works in a physical world, so in a digital world, they try to do exactly the same thing. So if you repost, so you basically participate in a whatever um, illegal activity you repost about. Uh, the majority of uh, those reposts are all about protest uh, these days. So um, to conclude a little bit, I know that it's a very brief thing, but as we are expecting Larissa to be very specific about uh, processing data, so I decided not to even go into that. So to conclude, uh, theoretically speaking, and if you think conceptually about it, Russia is actually uh, doing really well in terms of providing electronic services and uh, uh, providing a lot of digital platforms uh, to, uh, uh, to, to be used by uh, their citizens. At the same time, the level of um, uh, digital literacy, as well as the level of what I call digital citizenship, so that people use uh, digital platforms to exercise their rights and to uh, how the state accountable is actually quite high. At the same time, in a situation of what they call the authoritarian regime right now, uh, this is um, th this this is very risky in a sense that um, one hand is providing all the services and the other hand is creating the oppressive surveillance regime in which um, um, the whatever you do um, uh, on in in the platform or uh, or in your uh, sort of cyberspace is heavily policed. And uh, we theorize that uh, we actually predict that uh, the practices of dissimulation will also be transferred in the cyberspace in the sense that it will create a situation in which you want to um, sort of protect yourself and, and find pockets on the internet or in a cyberspace or in a digital platforms that are not regulated, that, that you know, that not surve surveilled. And um, uh, the Russian channel Telegram, for example, or, you know, the refusal, that's, uh, that's one of the um, examples where you need to get away from that and you basically protect yourself from the state or from the regulation of the state in terms of data processing and you like promise that your data is not exposed to uh, the government. Okay, thanks very much. And um, uh, if you have any questions or, or other ideas, we would welcome to um, um, uh, share.